slowly, subtly, over time, farther away from our relationship with Christ. How do we become worth less? Well, that's the end result of our wandering. As we drift farther and farther away from Christ, we in fact squander a little bit at a time the abundant life that He always intended for us. And the worst thing that we can do in the midst of our wandering and our worthlessness is to continue to be willful. So. Oh, it's alright You'll be there in the black of night Oh, it's okay You'll be there in the light of day And love will never end And Jesus is your friend Jesus is your friend down inside Well he's right here pulling on your heartstrings Won't you come and open wide Well don't be scared being clean, non-toxic, germ-free. Many of you, if you look in your purse or pocket right now, you have some of that pocket hand sanitizer right there handy just to use, just in case you need it. Kind of makes you wonder how we ever stay alive in previous generations, doesn't it? I walked into a public restroom not too long ago, and there beside the mirror were instructions for washing my hands. Did you hear that? Instructions for washing my hands. And I thought to myself, you know, I've been doing it for a number of years, and I think I've done it right. And I don't know that we need to be told how to do that, but we want to make sure that we're doing it right. And then I Googled safe and non-toxic yesterday. And these are the first things that came up. Number one, 11 lead-free lipsticks. That didn't interest me at all. I don't know why it was there, but it was there. The second one was safebaby.com, which is, I quote, a safe, non-toxic, echo-conscious, holistic, and healthy infant baby toddler block. Which made me feel totally inadequate because I remember those times as a parent when the kids would drop their pinky in the floor and I'd just wipe it on my pants like hand it back to them. <laughs> and then there was non-toxickids.com, which I don't mean to insult anybody's children, but I've raised three of my own, and I find that to be a complete oxymoron. <laughs> non-toxic children. Now, what if there are things that are not just toxic to our physical selves, but are toxic to our soul? Before we get into the meat of the message, I need for you to understand five basic truths. Number one, you are not a body with a soul, as many of us think. You are, in fact, a soul with a body. Your soul being primary as far as who you are. And just walking around the world is going to expose you to some things that are, in fact, toxic to your soul. We've all experienced it. You will see and hear things that you really wish you could undo. You'll spend time around people who are not seeking Christ. You will get caught up in the grind of making a life. And all of those things, especially when they're combined, can be toxic. 
Over the course of a day, you and I deal with temptation after temptation, so we have to be diligent. We have to pay attention. And in our steps to become casual, and I have no issue with casual, we've become a, a much more casual society, but in our steps to become casual, we must make sure that we do not become careless at the same time. And finally, sin is still sin, and its wages are still death. And tolerating sin not only taints and soils your soul, it will kill you, physically as well as spiritually. It becomes a matter of what you consider to be your normal. That's how it happens. It happens gradually over time, almost without perception. It's kind of like, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a confession that my wife is fully aware of, it's kind of like my injured knee. Melanie knows that I am famously stubborn when it comes to physical things and going to the doctor and all that, and I'm sure many of the men in the room will give me a hearty amen to that. In 1979, while still in high school, I injured my left knee. And I did what I was told at the time, taped it up, and kept playing. But I really messed it up good in 1992, several years, years later. And it swelled up big, and I could barely walk, and I moaned and I groaned, but I kept pressing on and did not go have it looked at. I lived with that stupid, messed up, popping out of place, pushing it back in me until 2010. Almost 30 years after I originally injured it. And then I went and had a very simple procedure, orthoscopically, that took care of it for me. But you see, that me became my normal. So that over time, I began to simply overlook it. It was just part of my life. And once in a while, it gave me grief. And so I would have to deal with it. And it was just my normal. Is there anything in your life that has just become your normal, that maybe you're no longer seeing, that perhaps could be, if you think about it, toxic to your soul. <laughs> there are so many things in this world that we have to be careful about, and Scripture teaches us that. And we have to be extra careful in what becomes our normal. We're going to look at three parables of Jesus in Luke chapter 15 this morning. I want you to turn there with me if you would, and I hope you brought your own copy of the Scriptures. If you didn't, I encourage you to develop a habit and take a copy of the, past, of the, the Bible from in front of you there. There's copies provided in the hymnal racks, and you'll find the book of Luke in the New Testament, and we're going to actually, over the course of the sermon, cover most of the 15th chapter, because the three parables there are often taken separately, but a careful reading of the text shows us that Jesus actually gave these three parables together. And they are, in fact, related to one another. And so, I asked for some help reading this morning. And somebody in this room should have Scripture number one. Would you read that for us, please? Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the story commonly referred to as the Good Shepherd, or the parable of the lost sheep. And it was one of my favorite little <clears throat> golden books as a boy. How many are old enough to remember little golden books? And I have looked and looked and looked to find a copy of this particular little golden book and it had a picture on the front cover of Jesus with a little lamb over his shoulders. You know how they carry the, the lamb that way. And I loved that book, but somewhere along the way, of course, it got lost or thrown out or something. I would love to replace it, but I've yet to find one. Uh, but exactly how did the sheep get lost in the first place? You have a hundred sheep, 
One of them is lost. How did that sheep get lost in the first place? Well, it wandered. And it wandered, you see, one blade of grass at a time. It was most likely innocent in its wandering. It didn't mean to go out and get lost and make the shepherd come look for it. But in the course of munching on the grass one blade at a time, not really paying attention, the little lost sheep became lost. When you and I begin to wander in our commitment to Christ, it happens gradually. There's not a single person in the history of the world who has ever woken up in the morning and said, today I'm going to go out and trash my relationship with Christ and wreck my life. Nobody does that. It happens slowly and subtly over time. That's why the scripture teaches in 1 Peter, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Is it possible our enemy, the devil, has suddenly drawn us away with a series of compromises over the course of time so that we've become desensitized to that which is right and wrong, good and evil, life-giving and life-stealing. And before you get nervous, this is not a legalistic message in which I intend to tell you all exactly what you can do and what you can't do. You are adults, and I am not the morality police. You can make these decisions on your own, informed by Scripture and led by the Holy Spirit, but I ask you to be honest as you say the words of David. Search me, O God. Search me and see if there be any wicked way in me. According to your definition of wickedness and sin. Not mine. You see, it is not my place as your preacher to define sin for you. It is not your place, in fact to define sin for you. God in the scriptures has already done that. And a careful student of the word, led by the Holy Spirit, can in fact live a life that is holy. Have you been wandering? Like the little lost sheep? Secondly, Jesus told another parable. And somebody has scripture number two. Would you read that for us now? Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Have you ever lost something valuable? Isn't it funny what has value? And why is it all the valuable things are really small and easy to lose? Of course, we've all lost something valuable, and there are two really stupid things people say to us when we're looking for something that we lost. First, when did you last see it? To which I always want to respond, if I knew that, I wouldn't be looking. It would not be lost. <laughs> Second, well, it'll probably be in the last place that you look, which of course makes absolutely no sense because none of us keeps looking after we find it. <laughs> and yet we say those things, those frustrating, maddening things. I once lost a marriage license after a wedding. See, it's part of the preacher's job after the wedding to get this, the marriage license signed, to make sure everything is in order, to get it put in an envelope and delivered to the courthouse of whatever county the wedding, the wedding took place in. And I performed this wedding... Poor Melanie remembers it. She's gone through a lot of these trials and tribulations with me, you see. And I, it was a Saturday, of course, and a beautiful summer day. The wedding came off without a hitch. And I got everything signed and put in place. And I set that marriage certificate and its envelope on my desk. And then I got distracted and walked away and did a few other things. Came back a little while later, decided I was going to straighten my office before I left the room. And I took this whole pile of papers and swept them off into the trash. <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. For the first and only time in my life, later that day, I was dumpster diving. And I'm happy to report.
report to you that I didn't find, in fact, find that marriage license. The marriage license would have, in fact, been worthless, and that's the second of our three W's. It would have been worthless had it been left in the trash. And that's the thing about that coin. Although it was precious to the woman that Jesus described in his parable, let's face it, if she had never found it, it would have lost its value. It would have, in fact, been worthless as long as it was lost. Now, when it comes to people, I do not mean to say that we are worthless. You are never worthless, regardless of your spiritual condition and whether or not you acknowledge Christ. You are not worthless because God's love for us is constant and unconditional. However, we are worth less when we're lost. We're worth less because we're living outside the covenant of God's grace. We are worth less because God has so much more to offer us in life than we have experienced without Him. That's why Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. He also said He came to seek and save that which was lost. That's Luke 19.10. So if you're sitting here and you feel worthless, I assure you, you are not. But if you're sitting here and you feel lost, Jesus is not going to stop pursuing you. He will continue to look for you. And so my gentle admonition is stop. Stop what you're doing right now. And don't be lost anymore. Stop running from Christ. And then the third W is willful. And someone has a little longer passage, and whoever you are, thank you, if you would read number three. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, and sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now this is one of the more well-known of Jesus' parables. Everybody's heard about the parable of the prodigal son. And this younger of the two sons was rebellious and foolish. We might even say that eventually, after squandering his father's wealth and living in ways that he shouldn't have been, that eventually life gave him exactly what he deserved. And we might have been judgment, judgmental and cruel and said, See, you made your bed, now lie in it, or any one of those other slang uh, terms that we use from time to time. Isn't that the way of things, though? Life has a way of coming back around and paying us for the way that we live. The good news is, however... The prodigal son finally came to his senses. Now you have to picture it. He finally hit rock bottom. I've not spent much time on a farm in my life. In fact, in fact I will tell you, I've been on farms more in the last year than in all my life previous. And so I am by no means an expert. But I have spent just a little bit of time, enough that it made an impression around pigs. And I've seen what pigs eat. 
And it's almost lunchtime, so I'm not going to go into any great detail, but you get the idea. How far down do you have to be in your life where you look at the stuff, the slop in the trough, and you think, that looks like dinner? You have to be pretty low. Life has to have gotten pretty bad. And that's exactly where this son got. Now, thankfully, he made the first good choice he had made in quite some time. He decided to go home. Thinking, of course, that his father would be angry with him, he decided to go home and confess his foolishness and ask if he could simply be a servant in his father's house. Never for a moment thinking that his place in the family would be restored. Human willfulness is one of the most toxic things you and I will ever encounter. Our own stubbornness, our own desire to do it our way, our own way, even as adults, of stomping our foot, either literally or figuratively, and declaring, it's my life, I'll do what I want. And many of us have attempted that strategy, and we have watched our lives be wrecked on the rocky shore of our own stubbornness. So here's the good news. I saved the conclusion of the whole story for myself. But while he, the son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and let's kill it and have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine, who was dead, is now alive again. He was lost and now is found. And so they began. How is it that we wander? One blade, one simple, innocent decision at a time as we move slowly, subtly, over time, farther away from our relationship with Christ. How do we become worth less? Well, that's the end result of our wandering as we drift farther and farther away from Christ, we in fact squander a little bit of time the abundant life that He always intended for us. And the worst thing that we can do in the midst of our wandering and our worthlessness is to continue to be willful, stubborn, And so, in these moments, Ponder for a moment. Only you can answer this. I can't answer it for you. No other person can. Pray the prayer that David prayed. Search me, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Search me. Check me. Am I wandering? Am I squandering the life that you have given me? I no longer wish to be willful. And I repent of my sin. And if I've not already done so, receive you as my Savior. I will this day choose to go home to my Father's house. What takes the biggest thing that's got you down? Stand it up right next to God well, Anyone can see who's bigger now And it don't take no astronaut So don't be scared Okay, 
Your friend. 